let's start off with a big picture question for our panel today. So as Anna mentioned in her presentation, we are on the eve of the conference of the 26th conference of the parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so this conversation is getting a lot of airtime these days. And within that UN Climate Change Convention, governments around the world, including Canada and the US, have declared net zero agriculture by 2050. So my question for the panel is, how do you see your organization or company contributing to that goal? So let's start with, uh, with uh, Scott. Yeah, thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity uh, to join you today. And thanks for the question, Denise. Um, as you mentioned, I work with a company called Devron and, and, and your specific question was, how, how can we help with, how can we help with this market? And, and so from that perspective, uh, we're an ag tech company. Um, we focus on data collection, data movement, data insights. And as you can imagine, um, these types of programs require a lot of data to drive them. Um, and so in reference to that, and in this conference here, we provide a carbon services program. Um, so as companies start to stand up programs um, that are starting to offer carbon offsets or the ability for farmers and growers to get into the market from a slide supply side perspective. Somehow we have to quantify what that data is and what the carbon stocks are and what the potential is within that soil. So from that perspective, we help uh, those types of companies um, quantify the soil then, or I'm, I'm sorry, pull soil and then quantify it uh, from a laboratory perspective um, then do analysis of the data and what is those numbers and do some um, projections how it would cross and then go back into the marketplace so then we put that number back into the marketplace so it can be bought and sold okay great thanks uh, scott so what i hear is that um you know your company is really in the game of helping farmers to uh, determine how much carbon is in their so in their soil and then being able to uh, sell that back to the market, whatever they sequester. Is that fair? Absolutely, that is. And uh, right. we almost say like we're we're almost like a if you look at a railroad, um, we're, we're, we we have the pipes between the physical soil, uh, the labs, and the market. So we're that we're that pipeline in between uh, to move around, let everybody understand what the quantification is. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. I can see how that would play an important role in helping us to understand uh, how we're going to meet those goals of net zero by 2050. So thank you. So let's turn over to uh, Peter now, who works in the university uh, space. And, you know, how do you see your college, Peter, contributing to that goal of net zero agriculture by 2050? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I, I think uh, the good news here is that um, you know, this whole discussion around net net carbon neutral and uh, sustainability is a, a part of the I guess is a common part of the narrative that takes place at most post secondary education institutions. What this is doing, I think, is driving um, a lot of new educational products um, and uh, that are much more applicable, I guess, uh, to the future. So there's a hyper focus in terms of applicability and usability. So less fluffs, more stuffs. In other words, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. So some of these products that, that are being developed across the landscape, across the educational landscape, include things like uh, work, work integrated learning, where people are finding meaningful partnerships with, I guess, quality partners to get real time, real needs met um, that are really uh, applied as well. So work integrated learning would be one of these things. I, I guess another um, application that's come to bear um, quite recently is this whole notion of micro credentials. So these are dense, highly focused affordable, convenient online products that are meant to give people the knowledge that they need in order to be more informed going into the future. And then, of course, there's a lot around uh, sustainability in this too. So again, these are for people who are looking at entering into the trade or um, I guess ostensibly also for people who are already in the trade as well. So again, it's, it's about convenience. And then there are products that are much more typical in terms of their duration. So we have a product of the college, a smart farm, um, that really looks at integrating emergent tech and uh, data-driven real-time decisioning. And of course, um, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, stuff like that, uh, 
to, to give students, um, like to give graduates, I guess, uh, a sort of better perspective on what they need to do in order to be more, uh, more sustainable. I, the, the retractors out there, they're smarter than I am, to be honest. So again, uh, when, when I think about this, uh, I mean, don't let this pass you by. Anyway, conversely, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, there's somebody like me in the low tech or the dumb tech. I look after our hop research yard. And so I'm using, um, I guess, knowledge that's been around for quite a period of time, but I'm mating that with uh, knowledge that's emergent right now in terms of just making simple differences to the, um, I guess, just the simple culture of hops. I'm in a brewing program, of course. And again, this leads into this whole notion of regenerative ag agriculture, which some people might think is just nothing more than organic ag agriculture, but is but which is in actuality, I guess, a coupling of time-honored knowledge that did produce with emergent knowledge that helps us make more refined decisions. And then lastly, I may as well talk about the, uh, this whole notion of, um, I guess, end-user applied uh, research. I'm involved with a couple of research projects. Uh, the one that may seem the most bonkers is the whole notion of carbon capture in breweries. So, so, you know, breweries typically um, allow fermentative uh, byproducts to emerge, carbon dioxide is one of these things, they allow it to uh, sort of uh, gas off into the environment, and then they pay somebody else to sort of uh, consume natural gas to produce carbon dioxide that they then artificially integrate into the beer. So there's a there's a, a, a something that's inherently wrong there. And then the other thing I would say that's uh, allowing us to sort of uh, I guess push the push the process forward would be this whole business of developing standards that seem to be lacking across the industry. So again, uh, anyway, I hope that's uh, somewhat useful. That's great, thanks, Peter. I think uh, universities <laughs> and colleges are going to be critical to helping us understand uh, and do the research uh, that we need done, as well as developing um, students and for the workforce uh, that we'll need in the future. So thank you for right. that. All right, let's turn to Sabrina. Sabrina, how do you see your organization contributing to the goal of net zero agriculture by 2050? Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me as well. Um, I think, you know, this is a, a, I love hearing what everyone has to say. And um, I was really appreciating what Anastasia had to say earlier because a lot of um, what really comes into play is education. And so for my company, what I'm doing is we're creating this tool um, so that people feel like they have some agency um, and some access to these carbon markets, meaning um, from the measurement side of things. And I think what it really comes down to is the people. Um, a lot of the work that we're all doing um, really hinges on uh, buy-in and um, the people that are going to use this ag agriculture technology. A lot of these people are already, you know, um, practicing regenerative agriculture. So for us, for me at my company, um, we are really looking at democratizing the technology. And a lot of the work has to go into helping people understand uh, what's even happening, why they should be involved, what's out there. And so I really feel like that we have the technology um, we have a lot of people here talking about great things, um, but a large piece of it is how do we get the people on board that are going to be the users? Um, we have the consumers out there, as Anastasia um, mentioned, but getting these farmers, these growers, these small producers in particular. And from our perspective, a lot of people that often get left behind, black, brown, indigenous, immigrant folks, um, all the underserved people in rural communities, um, we really have to make sure that they're part of this because they are making um, a lot of the, the changes on their land that they should have um, benefits from as well. Great, thanks, Sabrina. I really hear, you know, the opportunity to make sure we're inclusive as we uh, as we go forward here. There's, uh, you know, going to be a lot of trade-offs made, and uh, you know, I think at the global scale, those who are unfortunately already suffering the most uh have the there's the potential to have the greatest impact of climate change and so we really need to be thinking about how we can be inclusive and ensure access to technologies uh for all so thank you for that uh anthony let's go to you now um share with us how you see your company contributing to the goal of meeting our net zero agriculture by 2050 Thanks very much. Cheers, cheers, Denise. Thanks for 
uh, inviting us onto the panel today. And it's obviously been it's great to be part of this panel as well, actually. There's a few things I wanted to actually highlight, which everyone has just kind of said, which kind of relates to what I'm about to say. But look, as Sabrina was saying, it's an education problem. Um, it's a uh, climate change is a consumption problem. So we've got this, we think, why couldn't we just create food which we could eat, which reverses climate change? You know, wouldn't that be great? We can continue consuming, we can eat our way out of climate change. And we think that's very, very possible, certainly in certain crops. Um, we're specifically look starting this out in apples and top fruit. Uh, the apple, the humble apple is probably one of the most uh, carbon friendly uh, crops you can produce. Um, so that's where we are positioned and starting. So we have been, we have been um, the last two years uh, with some of the, one of the largest growers in the UK um, have helped them transition to be carbon negative, essentially. Um, so what we do is we give them software to help them to quantify their, should we say, their climate positivity. Now, climate positivity is not just carbon. It's things like improving biodiversity, uh, improving organic matter into the soil, so you're improving the water availability. And then the net result of all some of this uh, uh, is more soil organic carbon. Um, so we are actually working with people like uh, Deveron uh, specifically, uh, who help us, we pay, you know, we, we've been in their services to come and independently quantify those carbon levels. Um, and then we work with the grower to help them implement these practices. But we've developed a mechanism um, which we built on, on the blockchain um, and using smart contracts to connect to corporates or to conscious consumers, those who want to reward the growers for this, this, this practice. So a grower knows when they're utilizing on, on the BX platform that, hey, if I do implementing, if I do implement this practice, will I get rewarded? And this is what's happening at the moment in, in say, the food system, like the supermarkets, et cetera, tell them, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, but no one rewards the grower for that. But there's, as, you, as, we, as Anna mentioned earlier on, there's a lots of corporates are wanting to back this and support this. So we're trying to create this digital, um, this seamless payment system essentially for growers that is trusted. That's the beauty of essentially using smart contracts in the blockchain where the grower knows if he plants that cover crop or they reduce that damaging input, they're gonna get rewarded for that, for that activity. So we are, I wouldn't say building, I say carbon offsets, but we're kind of building the, what we like to say is putting the carbon offsets into the price of the food. And then we give the growers the ability to like shout about that that climate positivity. For example, in a QR code, they could put it on the pack of the apples, and then that can go that can reach the end consumer, and the end consumer can swipe that and see the exact provenance of the carbon from Devil, which everyone has given us the numbers on. They can see what activities were done. So that trust, that education, as Sabrina is mentioning, can start to happen. You know, it's going to start with the conscious consumer we need to get that rippling as fast as, as fast as possible. And we think that's the best way to connect the growers, the, the conscious consumers to, almost to the soil. Uh, and there's, there's technologies already out there today, which we're essentially bringing into this marketplace to, to enable this. I hope that gives you a good sense of what we're trying to do. Great, thanks, Anthony. I love the idea of uh, eating our way to carbon uh, net exactly. zero. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right, so I want to ask each of you individually now a question in your specific area of expertise. And Scott, I'm going to I'm going to start with you. So, sustainability is actually not a new conversation for farmers. It's it's it goes hand in hand with the profession actually. So, how do we embrace and incorporate these goals of net zero in a way that farmers will themselves embrace it rather than resist the change? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a few things that we can do, uh, what I'd say, to increase the adoption of that. If you look into the market, because this is what it is, it's a market of somehow, I mean, somebody's exchanging money for value. That's a market. If you look into it, uh, we've all hit on it that there is demand and we have we have quantifiable, you know, sources that there is more demand then there is supply. That means more people are looking to use agriculture to offset their carbon footprint or their or greenhouse gases or whatever. And, and they're look more people are looking at agriculture uh, than are currently selling. So that means there's a there's a mismatch between 
the market. Um, so what that means is us that are in the agriculture side of this need to do need to do things uh, to help more growers um, enter the market and you know start to enter their fields into or it's, it is fields or if you're looking at greenhouse gas reduction, it's their their practice uh, into the market. So one thing we can do is, and this is kind of very cliche, but demonstrate the value. Um, a lot of times, the, what is being communicated is just a number, just a, a financial thing. And it, it, that is important. That's very important. But it is more than that. So there are downstream effects of, as Anastasia said, when these things come on board, there's lots of additionality that will come out of, you know, reducing your carbon. So if we can better communicate to the growers, you're going to have better, um, you're going to have a better farming practice, you're going to have less runoff, you're going to have um, a more optimized, uh, uh, your, your soil health is going to improve just by doing these practices. That's, that's one way, better communication of the increased value. Um, even, even though we also need to work to increase the dollars that they get. Uh, another thing we, we really need to work on it is I'd call it simplifying the marketplace. Um, so if you look at it from a grower perspective, because that's the seller, if we have more demand, then we got to work on the supply side. So we got to work on the growers. Um, they, they're, they're farmers typically, and they're running multi-million dollar, you know, high cash flow businesses that they just, they just keep working all the time. This is a whole new language to them. So we need to, as best we can, simplify it uh, so they can understand what they're getting into. It, and it's not because, you know, a, a farmer is not educated. It's it's a new language um, and it's a new market and it's a new industry. So uh, those things will help accelerate their adoption. And I'd say, finally, um, uh, we need to work to reduce the, the paperwork or the overhead. So, you know, um, okay, you convince them to, you know, uh, join into this market and then you convince them of, you know, help them distill which markets to enter into. And then, okay, now here, do do uh, 30 hours of paperwork. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, well, maybe not. So, you know, though, if we can work on those three things, I think we'll have a lot more um, growers enter into the marketplace, which is going to help that supply demand off balance help. Great. Thanks, Scott. And, um, and maybe this is a good opportunity to bridge to Anthony. You started to share with us um, your vision for creating uh, value for farmers from soil carbon. Can you share a little bit more with us? Well, I think this is uh, this is what I've, we've experienced, to be honest with you. Like, I think this, this agricultural industry is trying hard to convert CO, like we talk about carbon credits and carbon credits are explicitly always talked about in CO2, but we are working in what's called soil organic carbon, which is a completely different form. And in, in, in my eyes, and I'm sure some people on this, on this panel as well, is like, that's much better than CO2. <laughs> and it delivers multiple, multiple benefits. It's not $50 a tonne, which, you know, we referenced the ETS market. It's probably 400, 500 pound a tonne. Let's be clear, the, the ecosystem services that soil organic carbon provides, you know, it provides nutrients, you know, it provides life, you know, it's, it, it provides uh, uh, water, um, flood protection, um, there's so much that it provides, which I think what Scott was saying is that we need to articulate the value of those ecosystem services. It we we have to distinct. It's completely different. We can't make it a fungible. It can't be fungible to the carbon credits of the oil and gas in, in of oil and gas and stuff like that. So I, I we believe that we've got to kind of really separate away. And so yeah, that's why we, we just want to talk about soil organic carbon, and it's completely different, and it's complete. It's it's, it's a much better. Uh, um, uh, carbon, if you want to call it a carbon credit or a carbon value. Um, we want to, our belief and vision is to make soil, soil carbon the most valuable asset in the world. You know, that's, it should be like, you know, if you're talking about gold, you know, we, we talk about it in our strategy sessions. Okay, how do we get soil organic carbon worth more than gold? How are we going to articulate that? And, you know, and I think that's, that's what we're trying to do by the data collection that we will do, all these activities and all the benefits it provides. Um, that's how we can kind of make that argument. But I, I fundamentally believe we've got to basically put that value into the price of the food. The price, and, I, and I don't mean passing that on to the end consumer because there's there's plenty of opportunity in that supply chain to that to be passed to the grower. Um, and, you know, I, we've already seen policy certainly here in the UK and in, in, the, in the EU is talking about 
uh, attacks on carbon emitting products, so maybe beef and you know, um, high high levels, but then subsidizing those you know tax breaks for those who are carbon tax, uh, less intensive. So that instantly then you, you know your that isn't more expensive foods. That fear of food prices increasing is just not true. And don't and let, let me just talk also about the specification of the supermarkets, right? Everyone goes, they worry about shifting to the regenerative agriculture. There's a fall in yield. Yield in the eyes of the supermarkets. Okay, I'm not just blessing, but it's generally that. Like, that's where a lot of this waste comes from. But if it's a climate positive apple or pear or whatever it may be, then actually that stuff that wasn't picked before can now be picked because it can, the end consumer accepts that one because it's it's a climate positive. It's like wonky or wonky veg if you've probably got it there in the US. Um, uh, unshapely fruits that kind of now is reaching the consumer but you know th it's the same sort of principle we can pick a lot more food or bring a lot more food to the consumer then you can lower the price and it can be cheaper to, to, the, to the end consumer so this is why I suppose we're a bit more hell-bent around just actually we're just going to put this all this impact and positivity into the actual increasing the value of the product of the actual crop versus trying to create this second revenue stream over here which fits the corporate agenda does that, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ambitious, I would say, Anthony. It's possible. We can do it. We're doing it today already, right? Yes, it's it's possible. We'll, it, it, it's, it's, it's doable. I don't think yeah. um, we're, we're, we're excited to show you soon. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right, let's bridge to Sabrina because we're having great conversation about, uh, you know, uh, technologies and, you know, what we can do in uh, North America and in the UK. But, you know, as we know, climate change is already impacting communities that are most prone to food security concerns. So how do we ensure equity and access to the best technologies for the farmers who most need it? Yeah, um, first of all, I love what you said, Anthony. I, I... I think that's all so fantastic. Um, and uh, to answer the question, I think, you know, again, we look at this through the lens of democratizing technology. And um, first, we uh, reconfirm always what equity and access even mean. So, of course, access uh, um, is the channels of acquisition. Um, but a lot of times, equity gets confused with equality, uh, where equity is about leveling the playing field and um, you know, not just providing everybody with the same opportunities, but providing more of the thing over here. Uh, so when we look at ensuring those things, um, we're really looking first at uh, keeping in mind the roots of the problem. And a lot of that relative to access is um, cost, right? I mean, there's affordability. And Another is education. Again, I've uh, mentioned that already, even knowing what the tech is that's available. Um, but then equity again relates to inclusion. And that has a lot to do with having um, people participate in the development of the technology. So when you're ensuring that both of these things happen, um, that means letting the stakeholders tell you what tools work for them. Um, I mean, I like liken this, I guess, to any customer discovery process, if you're in business at all. Um, and then you're focusing on the direct engagement versus indirect. So you need to directly communicate with communities in need. Um, you partner with trusted community organizers and um, agencies. And I will say that, uh, you know, all of this as a strategy actually works. Um, we've been doing this for almost 30 years. Um, our whole project at Seed grew out of open source technology. That's complete democratization. Um, it was DIY innovation from underserved farmers um, in really low income communities uh, in South Los Angeles, in Cuba, um, and so, you know, we did this by letting the people most impacted lead the way. That's equity and access. We put them at the center and it seems almost cliche to, to say this, but it seems that it needs to keep getting repeated. Um, this is about letting people decide what is the tech? Do they even want it? Not just foisting things on people. Um, how do they actually participate in making more of it? How do we get it to them? Um, 
And once you define the terms around equity and access these ways with the affected users, um, you're putting them in the center, then you can map out how to ensure that it happens. But we really have to start by looking at it from a people-centered process and letting them guide um, how this all takes place in their communities. Great, thanks, Sabrina. And um, we'll, we'll go to you now, Peter. So um, from the university and college perspective, you know, we're going to uh, need to really develop our students and our workforce of the future to meet those net zero uh, commitments. So what can you share with us uh, from your perspective about what's happening in that field? Well, I, I think, um, I think uh, more, more things change, the more they stay the same. I think students have always sought relevancy and, and applicability and meaningfulness. And I would say that that's even more so nowadays. Uh, I don't I don't think we're there just to reinforce myths or 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 just go with the marketing hype. I think they want uh, authenticity. I hate using that word actually, but I will use it in this case. So authenticity is what they're seeking, uh, and I can say that I hear that word every single day of my life. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, part of our mission here is to debunk the myths and to draw attention to things that uh, are no longer acceptable. So you know, I mean, I, I think we. I don't, I don't think we can allow it to persist. I, I don't think we can allow the present situation to persist as it's persisted to this day. So I, you know, just go back to Sabrina, the, an issue, and it's a bit, bit grim that I'll bring this up, but a huge issue in the brewing trade, for instance, is the, a lack of uh, DEI, right? Like a lack of diversity, uh, you know, equity and inclusion. So again, uh, the, to the credit of the Brewers Association in the United States and, and other uh, brewing associations, they recognize that they have to do this. So again, what we're doing now is recognizing meaningfully that there are issues that need to be addressed. Um, net zero carbon is one of them, but we need to integrate everybody into this partnership. It's not just something that we, you know, the, the, the just one sector of society uh, uh, needs, to, needs to deal with or needs to uh, draw attention to. So I guess uh, this whole notion of uh, making people aware of the problems is uh, probably the first and best thing we can do. Uh, the other thing I want to say is it's also about uh, duration and um, I don't know, duration and appeal. So again, it's, you know, not everybody wants to go to school forever, like I did. And so again, I think if we, if we short burst things and if we make it tremendously applicable, and, and again, the idea here is let's make this so, so it appeals to everyone, not just some people. So again, another issue in, in brewing is that, uh, for instance, when you look at uh, the people who drink craft beer, for instance, in major cities, they're incredibly diverse. But let's face it, uh, when you look at the makeup of the industry, it's not reflective of that diversity. So, so again, by addressing that, by, by you know, attending events, by promoting into these different communities, we can start addressing issues such as DEI, but also in the context of becoming um, more aware of what we need, need to do from a sustainable perspective. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that is at least part of the answer that people wanted to hear. Yes, that's great, Peter. Thank you. And uh, so we have uh, some time left and we've got some uh, questions from our audience. And I've got one here and whoever would like to jump in and address this question, feel free. But uh, what are, so, well, first let me put a little context to this. So we've got, a, you know, in Canada and the United States, a big job to do to meet this net zero by 2050. It's daunting. Okay, and there's lots of innovation happening out there. Okay, but we've got some big goals to meet in a rather short period of time. So what do you see are the biggest technological advancements that could take us in that uh, on that pathway in terms of carbon sequestration on the farm? What's the lowest hanging fruit, if you will, for us? So who would like to respond to that question? I'll pipe up uh, just initially and say that it's about education, really. I mean, uh, without education, none of it's none of it's applicable. None of it's um, you're not able to incorporate it. So people people have to have this. I don't want to say shunted into their faces every single day of their lives, but the thing is, we all need to be that much more aware, and that only comes by virtue of education. Great, thanks, Peter. Anyone else like to take a a shot at that, Anthony? I can see you took yourself off mute. Let's go to you. Um, I think it's similar. It, it's 
the, the biggest what, technological break. I don't think we need a technological breakthrough. We just need the knowledge. We've lost we've lost seventy years of knowledge on how to sequester carbon into the soil. Do you, do you want to move into this industrial agriculture? Has that's what's happened. We've all, um, conventional agriculture has de-skilled the industry to be to, not to no offense to kind of farmers or anything out there, but it's been to kind of monocrop, keep it one thing, and all that knowledge to kind of manage the whole ecosystem has, has been lost. So we need to go back to kind of this bit like, again, Scott, what Scott does really well is to help capture more data. You can capture that soil data, but then you need to capture what all the events have happened through the year, through that time and what practices to understand how do you put more carbon into the soil? And every field is different and every, there is no one formula and it's a biological breathing thing. And so it's going to constantly change its capability to, to sequester carbon. And we just got to learn that. We've got the technologies. We've got AI. We've got, we've just got to actually have, the problem is it is actually, I'm a big believer, it's a people problem in this industry. So we've got to bring the talent into, they need to stop, we need to stop people from moving adverts around a screen, right? Some of the best talent in, our, in the world is moving adverts around a screen and getting as addicted to, to, to the companies that we know, right? Let's take that, that talent needs to get out there and come into agriculture and apply that knowledge. And let's get people addicted to climate change, right? And putting carbon back into the ground. Wouldn't that be cool, right? So um, that's what I think needs to happen. And we've experienced a bit of that in that I've experienced the last five years of good, great people coming into ag tech and the impact it can have. And, and the team that we're building, for example, you know, it's a team of many other people who've been at Amazon and Google's and they're coming in. So it's happening, but we've got to accelerate that. So that'll be, that'll be for me, if we can open the floodgates to talent coming into this industry. Great, thanks, Anthony. Sabrina. I, yeah, just uh, piggybacking on that. I think, you know, the talent is out there in the, people that I've been working with. I mean, this is all about people uh, recognizing where the value is, right? And so when you talk about 70 years, um, what we've lost in 70 years, a lot of communities haven't lost that out of necessity because they don't have access to um, a lot of the, you know, even cost of fertilizers when, you know, that was something that was, uh, you know, being pushed on them or whatever. So I think the, the, the knowledge is out there it again is centering who is doing the yeoman's work out there, going out and finding out what that, um, that knowledge base is and, and people that are stewarding the soil and have been um, because they haven't had any choice but to do it that way. Um, so I, I, I love all that. And I think that, you know, just let's all remember that the talent is out there. Mm. Great, thanks, Sabrina. And Scott, over to you. They've all hit on very good things, so I, I'm not going to rehash anything they said because those are all right on. Those I'll just add a couple things. Are um, Anthony did mention that hey, um, like uh, carbon in by itself, it, there's there's more to it than just that, and a couple of those things are very low hanging fruit. Uh, one is like optimize uh, nitro nitrogen usage. Um, you know, instead of applying it at a blanket rate, uh, continuously work to optimize its use. Um, and that leads right into then um, continuously work to remove marginal production land out of production. Uh, and that that is a complete uh, mental shift for, from a lot of growers. Um, most growers farm all of their land, rightfully so. But as you can get more data and understand which land is marginal, you might be applying um, uh, chemicals or fertility or nitrogen or you know, seed or, and driving combines and tractor over land that the value of food that's coming out of it is actually lower than the cost to get there. So as we can work to remove those two things, those are very low hanging fruit that'll greatly accelerate that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can just imagine 10% land is marginal, right? There's a bunch of numbers right there. Yes, very good. Thanks, Scott. And, uh, you know, certainly I, I think at least in, in here in Canada, the government has identified some some key areas uh, that would make a, a big difference uh, for reducing our, our carbon and sequestering uh, our carbon in Canada. So uh, that's great. We have in the US and Canada, we're lucky to have these large tracts of land where we can you know, have soil be a real sink for carbon. Uh, so it's a great opportunity there for farmers. And, and it really uh, requires some of what you were speaking to monetizing uh, things differently uh, as we go ahead. 
So we've got a couple of minutes left on our panel. Any final comments that anyone would like to uh, make? Can I just say one thing about soil, um, about again, the carbon offset market, and carbon credit market. There's, a, I think there's a, I don't, I, I just, this is just my statement. There's an obsession about permanence. Um, and let's be clear, carbon is not permanent. <laughs> it's, it's a carbon cycle. It mm -hmm. just keeps, keeps cycling and we just, we just unbalance that cycle. That's the problem. So I look, direct air capture and everything else has got a value and it would be, uh, be helpful. But, uh, you know, the, the nature, nature is the strongest force here and it will always come back and we'll, you know, I'm, I'm very fearful of what the impact, the geological impact, whatever it may be from like things like artificially putting CO2 into containers and sticking it back in the ground. And I, I think we should try and work with nature's you know, nature's showing us what it wants to do and what it will do. Like look at Chernobyl, you know, we, just, we messed it up, right? As a human species and, it, and nature's come roaring back and cleaned it up, right? It's always cleaning it up. So let's, let's not work against it. Let's work with nature. Let's use, let's, uh, Let's listen to it. So I think we should, the carbon credit market needs to not emphasize this permanence towards soil, you know, to agriculture and soil carbon. We should certainly encourage it to be kept there and we should encourage growers to add there because it's better to increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. But I think there needs to be a real detachment there. I think that's, that's something that's gonna hopefully happen in the next few years as people wake, wake up to that. Yeah, no, it's a very good point, Anthony, because we are working with a living biological system on this planet. And so we have to be conscious that we can increase the sink, but it is ultimately a cycle, as you've said. So I want to thank our panelists uh, today. Thank you so much. It's been uh, a really engaging conversation.